give you all the praise, all the glory. We thank you we can come again tonight. Lord, we thank you that you would lead us, you would teach us, you would develop us. Lord, that you would bring us to a place in you that's a right place. A place, Lord, where you truly are the shepherd of our life. You cause us to lie down in the green pastures. You lead us beside the still waters. Lord, you are the shepherd of our life. And we thank you for that. And so we ask that even as the disciples sat at Jesus' feet and he taught them, we ask tonight to sit at the feet of the Holy Spirit. That he would teach us and that your word would penetrate and Lord, go deep down within the soul, Lord, that it would become fertile and reproduce thought patterns on the inside that would bring forth a renewing to our soul, to cause our soul to align up with the spirit man, that unity would come within us, that we would command the blessing, that we would be single-minded, that we would be all that you require us to be, Lord, to break through to new levels. You said a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. Lord, we seek to change that by causing our thoughts to become your thoughts and your thoughts to become our thoughts, Lord. We desire to become single-minded with the Word. We desire to become unified with your purpose, your plan, Lord, and your revelational gift within our lives to teach us and develop us. So come, Holy Spirit. Teach us. We, Lord, can study it, we can ponder it, but only you can reveal it to us. Break down the strongholds, the imaginations, the fantasies, the doctrines of man and the doctrines of devils that come to mar the picture of Jesus Christ and all that he represents. Lord, let our faith grow tonight. Let it be energized. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're doing the foundational series. I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. I'm going to read the first two verses and then meditate a little bit on verse 3 before we go further. I never got to it last night, but I want to get to it tonight. And this is a continuation of faith towards God. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto the perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, and of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, verse 3 says. This we will do if God permits. Do you know that we really need to understand that if we want to grow in God, and we want to move in God, we have to have the rite of passage for revelation. And to get the rite of passage for revelation, let's go and have a look a little bit at the natural that we can get an understanding of. In the natural, when we're in school and we started in the beginning, we go to one, two, three, four, five, as we progress through. So as we're progressing through, if, if we don't pass grade one, grade two will be awfully hard. If we don't pass grade two, grade three will be virtually impossible. And by grade four, we hate school and we hate everyone that's trying to teach us because we don't understand what they're trying to say, because each level should be the revelation to interpret the next level. And so people that just uh, try to get through the grades without understanding the grades wind up in a, a bad place. And so, you know, you have to get the permission from the teacher who believes that you received enough revelation on the first grade to go into the second grade. Amen? And so they call that a pass. You, you pass, you, you go on, you, you have enough depth to, to, to understand what's going to be taught in the next class without it overwhelming you. And so here, the Lord is saying that we, he won't let us go on unless we understand these doctrines. He said, unless the Lord permit... You know, when you have a look at that and you try and understand that, to understand that, let us go back into chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 12 of chapter 5 that bring us down to these verses. And he says this, because, you know, in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, therefore, when you find a therefore in the Bible, find out what it's there for. 
It's there because of the verses before it. So he says this, for when for the time, in verse 12, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And have become such that have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so here he's saying that I want to share more with you, I want to teach more to you, but I can't because you won't understand it, because you haven't really set yourself to understand the first principles of the oracles of God, which is the foundation of Christ or the understanding of the teachings of Christ and what Jesus was teaching as points of interpretation. You will have your own doctrine or you'll pick up doctrines from foreign spirits. Christ has to be the cornerstone of your teaching. Not his name, what he stands for. So many people say, well, I have the doctrine of Christ, and it's their own imagination of who Christ is. It has nothing to do with the systematic doctrines that he taught that release people from bondage. That prepare them for heaven. And they just wind up totally mixed up, going from this emotional thing, to that emotional thing, to prophet dingling, to sister bucket mouth, to this prophecy over here, to this word over here, this teaching over here, trying to make something work. From one crazy dream to another. Rather than building systematically to a plan that has been proven to be sound and engineered by heaven. That's why he said to, when he looked for a man and he looked for a woman, or anyone to represent him, and he gave them revelation, he said, you build it exactly as I've shown it to you. Don't you alter anything. This plan is not up for alteration. I don't care about your opinion. What I want is your obedience. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? But we look at something, and everything that we basically do, it's very hard to find someone today that you can give them a job without them putting their 25 cents worth in. Or their dollars worth. Or their ten dollars worth. Or it doesn't even look like the plan that you gave them by the time you get it back. Because they want to do it their way. And really what they're screaming out is, what about me? I want to be here. I want... And you disqualify yourself. And your life is full of unfinished projects and full of hurt. Because everyone walks away from you. And you wonder why. You wonder why people are not having you on speed dial to call you up when they run into trouble. And yet, that's what you want in your heart. But they don't see you as a solution. They see you as part of the problem. When you become a problem solver, that's when people start wanting to pay the megabytes and look for you and wait in line, sit there for hours, days, weeks, make an appointment to try and get to you because they believe that you have the answers. Because you've taken the time to find out what works and what doesn't work. Rather than giving them something high pie in the sky that leads to their next hurt, their next disappointment. And so many people are just one disappointment away from suicide. Some people are one disappointment away from divorce. They're one disappointment away from bankruptcy. They're one disappointment away from giving up the ministry. What they need is faith built into their lives. What they need is understanding built into their lives. And so he's saying, I want to teach you more, but you, you, you're children. He says, and so therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, he says, this is what's going to qualify you if you can pass these things. Where he, he comes out and he says, you know, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, what is the doctrine? Therefore, leaving the principles of the teachings of Christ. 
the essence of Christ. You see, a Pharisee or a Sadducee that would wait and, and, and take people to themselves would put their mantle upon them. And that mantle represent the yoke. And that mantle, when they touched them and said, come follow me, come learn of the depth of knowledge that I have and the things that I want to teach you about life. So when Jesus said, come follow me, he was calling disciples to himself. He was calling them to take the yoke. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. He said, let me teach you. Let me bring you to an understanding. So what is he going to teach? This is what he was teaching them. The doctrines and teachings of Christ. And when we see that and we break that down, where it's repentance from dead works. Well, most people don't get past the word repentance. I've seen so many people, well, I teach that. You've never taught that because if you did teach that, you wouldn't be living the way you're living. It would have changed your life. And you wouldn't be in the problems that you're in. That's the bottom line. That's the evidence of those whom the Son has set free are free indeed. Because these, these doctrines work. These are the doctrines of life, not death. They breathe into your life. They breathe into your success. They breathe into your joy. Freedom. So he's talking about the doctrine of repentance from dead works. People get caught up in repentance, but you already know how to repent because you're saved. You have to repent to be saved. He's trying to teach you what dead works are. And so many times I ask very seasoned Christians, give me an understanding of dead works. And they're all over the road. They want to talk about repentance. I say, look, I know what repentance is. I want to know, do you know how to use it? If I held up a gun and gave you a gun, you tell me that's a gun. You might be able to cock it. But I want to know what you're going to shoot with it. How are you going to use it? What's the application? And so the doctrine of the application of the knowledge of change. But very few people have ever grabbed it. They just want to talk about repentance. And then you get in faith towards God, where we're talking about now. And when they get into faith towards God, they can't get past faith. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then they start to get into faith, and into faith, and into faith. But it's not anything to do with that. It's faith towards God. How much can you trust God? You know, it's amazing. You've got to keep reminding yourself. I woke up this morning and there was a situation after I taught on faith towards God last night. I was laying in bed and I was thinking about a situation that I had to do and had to confront. And I said, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And all of a sudden my spirit said, faith towards God. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an amazing thing that you've got to continually Remind yourself that you have to put your faith in God. That God is not there just to help you work out your little fantasies, but is there for you to come and to realize He's the boss and you work for Him, and He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And He's asking you to get involved in His plan rather than you getting Him involved in your plan. How do you get involved in what God wants you to do rather than try to become friends with God to get him involved in what you want to do? So it's faith towards God. Then the doctrine of baptism is plural. And most people can't even understand water baptism. They can't understand baptism. You know, justification by faith is the immersion into the blood of Christ. It's called justification. Sanctification is immersion into the water, into the word of God, for the washing of the soul, to make it line up with the life that the blood has purchased. Immersion into the Holy Spirit produces an empowerment to overcome temptations 
and to live a righteous life and to bring your life into a productive area of self-control that produces something. Which releases you to the fourth and last baptism which is immersion into your destiny. To find your place where you belong. That you're not looking and taking this and taking that. That all of a sudden you become somebody that somebody's after because you can do the job. I don't know, when I was pastoring, how many people came in and wanted to pastor and they would have revival by, by, by decrease? You know, you give them a hundred people and two weeks, they're, they're, well, God's just sifting them out. I said, gee, they were doing well when they were with us. <laughs> Amazing. Because they're no, they don't know who they are. They're always looking somewhere else because they've never really discovered. They don't know they're calling an election. I'm going to get into that. We'll get into that later. So I'm just going through and getting an understanding of why we need to know these things. So he says, if we know them, then he'll let us progress. Why won't he let us progress? What is, why is he holding us back? Well, when you get to verse 3, and you, you really want to know, then you've got to go into verse 4. So it says in verse 3, and this we will do if God permits, if God gives us a pass. If he sees that we understand these doctrines, and that we have a workable knowledge of them. Why? For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Wow. Don't you wish that wasn't in the Bible? <laughs> So he says, I'm going to judge you on every level of accountability. God would rather our spiritual retards and looking after us where he can redeem us and he can bring us in. Rather than people that are going out there that know and are capable of, of premeditated rebellion. Rebellion is when you know what to do when you choose to do the opposite. When you know and you've t tasted of the heavenly gift and, and you know that God has brought you out and you made a calculated decision to go against it. That's a pretty heavy statement. Just ask yourself how many times that would infuriate you if your child did that. <laughs> now you wouldn't feel, you wouldn't, it's not so much that they disobeyed you. You would start to lose hope for their destiny. Because you know if they can't listen to you, they're not going to listen to anyone else. You know if they're the biggest voice in their own life, they call that narcissism. They're narcissistic. They're unteachable. And they're opening themselves up for a whole world of strife. So God is wanting us to learn and to be able to flow and so it's not just an academic thing. It has to start, it goes deeper than that. We had a look at the necessity of faith that by it the elders obtained a good report last night. We just kept on that for one second. It says in, when, when we look at that in, um, and, and, and get it in, in, into um, Hebrews 1, 2. Now faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. And verse 2 says, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony or a good report, a good character. My faith, and we're going to have a look at that deeper tonight, of how do we apply our faith? How do we spend our faith? Isn't it something when you give somebody a large sum of money, you want to watch how they spend it? Isn't that the parable of the talents? And so we need to understand that God is watching how we invest what he invests in us. And faith is the currency of heaven. Are you going to use your faith 
to get a better car, a better life, a better wife, a better husband? What are you going to use your faith for? We had a look that faith becomes the shield or the covering dome of a leader. A pastor should have enough faith to cover their congregation and to keep them safe. A husband who is the head of the house is not the head by decision and how loud he can talk. His faith should cover the family and keep them safe. He should put a shield of faith over them which quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy. A blanket of peace for them to grow up. A blanket of peace for them to prosper up. That's what faith does. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. He causes us to lie down in green pastures. Man, he, he puts a dome of faith over us. We don't even, we shouldn't even know there is a devil because he's already dealt with the devil. Actually, I want you to go somewhere with me because you need to understand this. How do you know how mature you're getting and how much faith you're getting because the stages of growth? Because he says here when we read in Hebrews, you are a babe and you need milk. He qualifies the stage of life by calling us a babe. He says, you're a baby, you're helpless, you can do nothing for yourself. You need somebody caring for you. He said, oh, I, I wish you could go on to a higher level. Powerful, isn't it? So if you, if, if you really want to turn with me, turn with me to um, 1 John. Go with me to 1 John, chapter 2. That's little John, not big John. 1 John, chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 13. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because ye have known the father. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Isn't it amazing that it's talking about um, children here, it's talking about a young men, and it's talking about old men, and he's saying that the older one knows God from the beginning to the end. In other words, they have a full understanding of when they're looking at God, they're not looking at him through a keyhole. They're seeing the broader picture of who God is and how God works in balance. They have a father's understanding. They're talking about children who are excited because they understand they were saved. Talks about young men because they have now grown to a status where they have overcome the wicked one. How do you know that someone has even come to a stage where you can even send them to war because they have overcome the wicked one? And he goes on to, to say it again when he repeats that twice. And he gets into it when he, when he says in verse 14, I have written unto you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong. The word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. When you start to see somebody that's not fighting the devil every day but has taken ground out there and the devil means nothing to them because he's a defeated foe. But most people spend most of their time worried about what the devil's doing and where the devil's up to and what, what the devil's saying rather than what God says and what God has done and what God has given us. The Bible says he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. But he, and then he tells us to give no praise to the devil. Now we know that we can slip into that negative vacuum and start to fight him by living in the midheavens whether, which is a battle zone, or we can be seated in Christ far above all principality and power and might and dominion in the third heaven. Amen. Where revelation is flowing, where victory is there, the devil can't come. You know, I, I, I've, I've said, you, you know, people have come and said the devil's accused. Man, he's accuser. His job is to accuse you before the throne of God. The devil can't accuse you if you're born again. He can accuse the old you. 
But he can't accuse the new you because he doesn't know your name. The Bible says when you're born again, God gives you a new name. That he knows, you know. But the devil doesn't know. So how can he accuse you if he doesn't know who you are as a new person? It doesn't make sense. And we give so much time. And you know that when you hear someone's always talking about the devil, they want to be Jesus. They want they, they resent the fact that Jesus is defeated. They paint themselves up like some big soldier. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to rescue humanity. I got news for you. They've all been rescued. <laughs> Jesus accomplished it on the cross. He spoiled principalities and powers. It's our job to go out there and tell them the good news. <laughs> you know, you get in some people and they imagine they listen to God, devil, God, devil, two big giants going to have a clash. They're going to they're gonna smash together. They're going to, oh, God, devil, man, I'm stuck in the middle. God, devil, rather than God, devil. Yeah. Under the feet. Mm. Faith towards God. Faith towards the finished works of the cross. Faith towards the knowledge that he has defeated principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. How dare you try to build your reputation and try to make yourself look something because you don't really believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has defeated the devil and you're going to go in and finish the job for you. Shame on you! You want to steal something? Go steal something else, but don't steal from Calvary. Because you're robbing someone's destiny. Because you can't even get out of your own way. If you would, you could have done it. You wouldn't have done it a long time ago. You wouldn't be here tonight. But if you'll listen to me and come to faith towards God, that he has done all that he said he did, and he has accomplished all, and get away from the gates, the the names, the 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 and the 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 and he is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. When he said he done the devil in, he done the devil in. Doesn't matter what the devil has to say about it. Jesus Christ is the victor. Why do we want to be somebody at his expense and the expense of Calvary? It was him that died on the cross. We need faith towards God. We need to see God differently. We need to, you know, well, bro, you know, I was talking to some people today, we're having dinner, and, you know, I believe that music, I believe that when David played, the devil was bound. But, uh, we, we, you know, that's the way they had it back then. They didn't have Jesus. They just had David. They didn't have the King of Calvary. They didn't have the name that was above every other name. They didn't have the blood. That destroyed every yoke. They didn't have that. So you can go after someone with a club or you can take an Uzi. The Uzi represents Calvary. The club represents going back in time and, 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 and doing something that they did prehistorically. Well, you can move into the finished works of the cross and believe that Jesus has and that he has sent you forth to plunder and that when you go into a city, you don't see how strong the devil is. You go in and you see how strong God is. That was the problem with the, the spies that went down to the promised land. Twelve of them went. Only two of them saw the potential of God, which was Caleb and Joshua. The other said, nevertheless, there's giants down there and we was grasshoppers in, in, in our own sight, so we were grasshoppers in their sight. If you don't have faith in God and that God is finished, you will never see yourself the way God wants you to see. And therefore no one else will ever see you. All too often I've had to counsel people and in counseling them, 
They want, you know, they, they, they really want to grow, they want to go, they, 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 they really want to become something. And they say, why don't people see who I am? Because you haven't seen who you are. You're trying to convince people you're something. Rather than walk in the authority of what God's given you. And if you haven't accepted yourself, why would anyone else accept you? If you haven't accepted what God has made you, then why would someone else accept you as? If you don't accept yourself as a woman, why would someone else accept you as a woman? If you don't accept yourself as a man, why would someone else see you as a man? If you see yourself as a grasshopper, of course they're going to see you as a grasshopper. That's the way you see yourself. As a man believes in his heart, so is he. So you can never ever become what you can't see yourself being. But you're trying to convince people you are, and you're trying to get them to tell you you are, so you can have faith that you are. Mm -hmm. Rather than to believe it and do it. Mm -hmm. And become it. Mm -hmm. You believe you're evangelist, how many people you wonder the Lord? If you believe you're a leader, look over your shoulder and see how many people follow. Mm -hmm. No one's following, you might need to readjust yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? There's some things we've got to do and there's some things we've got to work on. There's some things we've got to achieve. Are you hearing me now? Yes. So we're dealing in faith towards God. You see, in, you, know, you know, as a trainer, I see potential in people. I was a sports trainer. I trained people in business. I, I trained people in different areas. I even trained people how to become criminals. <laughs> And, and you, you can't teach someone that doesn't want to be taught. Someone is trying to teach you. You send them home. Dear yeah, Jesus, help me. Yes. <laughs> and so, he's saying here, that young men, if we've reached the status of being young men or young women, what should be the characteristics that we have overcome the wicked one? When you come up against a person and they say, we're well able to take the city. We're well able to make this grow. We're well able to take this down. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I serve a risen Savior. Yeah. I serve a Savior that's that spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them open. Yeah. He has anointed me with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. His word in me is a sharp two-edged sword. Yeah. To build faith into the heart of the faithless. Mm -hmm. To build faith for healing. To build faith for prosperity. To build faith for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. To find myself. How can you help someone find yourself when you haven't even found yourself yet? <laughs> You're still a dog chasing his tail. <laughs> huh? Seriously. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pastor, apostle, evangelist, <laughs> prophet. <laughs> Being a <lamb. laughs> I want it all smiling. Oh, oh, give me, give me, give me, give me. Come on now. So faith starts to grow. Where does it grow from? It grows from love. Love is what tempers us to mold us and to shape us. And if we can pervert love, someone can actually come in through the doorway of love and corrupt us. Or someone can come in through the doorway of love and build us up. We've just got to know and understand the attributes of love and what they look like. And if it has anything to do with sex, smack them outside the head. I know people that have such a relationship with their animals that it's true love and there's no, no sex involved. 
But that animal will die for that person and they'll die for their enemy. Because they've found something that's connected with them. I want to tell you, if, you've been, if you're having sex to prove love, then you haven't had love because you've never touched the spirit of the person you're with. Because when you've touched the spirit and the mind and the heart of the person that you're with, it belittles sex. It comes in way down the bottom. When you can sit and talk with somebody all night, when you can, when you can, you, when you can become involved in somebody and trust your life to somebody. Knowing they've got your back. That's faith. See, faith worketh by love. That's what Galatians 5 and 6 says this. It says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So love is the beginning of and a lot of people have love, but they just, they, 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 and, and I looked at that the other night when we saw that God loved Job and Job loved God, but he wasn't, his love held him to God and held God to him. But he got the living daylights beaten out of him until he got knowledge because we're destroyed through lack of knowledge, not lack of love. Love has to be directed in good works. Love has to, number one, you know that you've got love when you prefer someone more than yourself. When you actually have connected with somebody and you want to see them more successful than you are. And you're willing to take a back seat to help them become who they need to be. That's when you know that you started to connect to real love. A toxic love is when you want to be loved, that someone will come on board to help you become who you want to be. Rather than you shaping the destiny of another, investing love like God did for us. See, with that type of understanding, a toxic understanding of love will take a scripture like this. It doesn't produce the faith of righteousness that causes deeds of righteousness and true genuine works of faith. You will read the scriptures as faith for the wounds of a friend. So you will then look at that person and say, man, I love you, I'm going to beat you to hell. I tell you, I just got to tell you the truth, how ugly you really are. Because I love you, you know. <laughs> What a, what a complete manipulation of scripture when it says faithful of the wounds of a friend. It's talking about not the wounds they've inflicted, but the wounds they're born for you. Jesus was a friend that loveth more than a brother. He bore our infirmities. He was wounded for our transgression. He was talking about laying down his life for his friends. He said, I'm going to, I love you so much. I'm going to pay the price for you. When somebody loves you enough that they're willing to put their reputation on the line and say, man, I'm going in after him. I don't care if there's bullets coming this way, that way. I'm going in to get him. I'm going in to get her. I'm not willing to leave her in there. I'm not willing to, my God, no, no way, devil. You're not going to have that one. Not on my watch. And you're willing to risk your life to go in there. My God, when some Christians fall, we have a celebration. Is out of the way now. We can prosper. He's <laughs> taking too big of the pie. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but I've had that immature love. But at some point, you've got to grow up. Amen. At some point, you've got to move in and realize why you're there, and and that you want to build some type of credibility. You want to build some type of. A trust. 
which we call faith. Faith worketh by love. When someone loves you, you trust them. You can you can go to them and you can pour your heart out to them. And you can tell them anything and you can talk about things. Boy, I had people that I have close relationships with that told me some of the things that did make your hair curl. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> No, serious. Because they build with faith. They learn to believe again. Again. But the Bible says that the wounds of a, a tail bearer, someone who uncovers, someone who repeats a mouth, goes deep down into the very depth of our being, wounds our spirit. The Bible actually says it this way. The spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. In other words, when your spirit is healthy, there isn't an obstacle that you can't overcome. You know, I was talking to Chris Harvey, and Chris, Chris likened it to me this way. He said, you know, when I went through some things, Wayne, he said, what really wounded me more than anything else, and I can identify, he just put it in such a nice way. If anyone's ever seen that, that movie, the... the um, with Mel Gibson in it, the, um, where's the, the warrior, what's it called? Brave, Brave. Brave. How he was fighting and he was, you know, you freedom! <laughs> I love that. And when he actually gets the king, he thought it was his friend, but he didn't know it was him and he pulled off the arm, I pulled off his, pulled off his helmet and found out he was betrayed by the very man he was trusting. And he went away, he lost his breath, he, he lost his ability, he lost his faith, he lost his reason for fight. A wounded spirit, who can bear? When you go through that, it steals and it overthrows your faith. It's a, it, it, it's a deep hurt to recover from. You see, Having faith towards God is to believe that God, when he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, even if you leave me, I'm going to still be waiting here for you. When you're ready to rock and roll and do it my way, come on back. We'll get this stuff done. Mm -hmm. But he says, I'm not going to follow you into hell. But I'll wait right here for you. You can return to me anytime you like I've got an open door policy. Pretty tough, isn't it? And that's what you learn through these doctrines that you don't get into condemnation, that there's no sin you can't be forgiven for. There's no doorway you can't walk back through when it's the doorway to Christ, the doorway to reconciliation. Only you've got to humble yourself to do that, not submit to the very thing that's causing your faith to be stolen from you. Which is pretty powerful, isn't it? So faith that works by love. Now, I want to have a look at the book of James because you know that you have faith not because of the works that God does, but the works you do. And so I really want us to get our mind around this to see faith works. When we have faith towards God, we have faith to conquer. We have faith to push back the darkness. We have faith to break through and destroy the enemy's kingdom. And so when we have a look at James, and we read this in James chapter 2, read from 14 to 26. James 2, 14 to 26. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Can faith die? Absolutely. 
You have to stir up the gift of faith in you to make, bring it back to life. He goes on to say this. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, what faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So how many people actually think they believe in God and they're willing to put their life in God's hands until they have to? How many people can really say that they really believe in God and are willing to put faith actions to believe in? That when they're sick, instead of running to the doctors, they, they put their faith in God. When their back is against the wall financially, they can hold on until God breaks them through. That they can sow in desperation. Sow in tears that you might reap in joy. You can't give away your last dollar as a seed. You want to eat it, you're a glutton. You've got no vision. But you've got to see the need to sow. You've got to see the need to put faith actions. Faith without actions is dead. Well, I have faith, brother. Of course you do. <laughs> Lazy. You have faith in other people's faith. When we have faith, that faith enables us to, through love, become a giver like Abel was. And he was, by faith, he offered a better sacrifice than his brother Cain. By faith, he, he, through love, faith mixed with love produces wonderful works where you want to bless someone that's been blessing you and, and love someone that's been loving on you and, and even want to see the person that hates you and living in bondage and fear and, and ugliness that you want to see them change. <coughs> and you realize that your love is powerful enough through your faith actions to change them. Well, I just love him. Have you ever told him? No. Have you ever showed him? No. He should love me first. <laughs> Hello. You still with me? No? <laughs> Getting pretty quiet in here. <laughs> so let's just go and read a little bit more from, from, from Hebrews 11. And read for verse 4 and 5. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should know, not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him for before his translation he had his testimony that he pleased God. It's impossible to please God without faith. When we read verse 11, uh, chapter 11, 7, 16. By faith Noah being warned of God of the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, 
obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he went. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city whose maker and builder was God. When your faith is so real and you can trust God, you don't even have to have it at stake on your plate. You've just got to see that that's the purpose and it's going to take some time to do. And this is the verse I want to get to tonight. When we are mature enough to redeem our family and pray the price for our family, then that we can give them an inheritance. You know, the inheritance that we store up is not a house and money and gold and silver. It's a, a good name. What we store up is a righteous inheritance, a purity in the spirit where we break every yoke, where we pull away from every every curse and we, we develop a, a, a righteousness in the spirit for our children to prosper. A clean place. And this is what he says here. Listen to this. Because this is powerful. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, they embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. My God, here he's saying that Abraham, he was promised to have children. We are his children of faith. Yeah. We are the children. He is the father of many nations. We are his children, faith children, today. But did he see them before he died? Did he see us? By faith. He had Isaac. He had Ishmael. He had two sons that were going to bring in and eventually come together through the blood of Jesus. And the truth of it is that when you read it and you understand scriptures, it really is. It says that Ishmael's children would be greater than Israel's children in the land of promise. There'd be more of them than the Jews. And that's true today. That more of the Gentiles have come in than Israel. My Lord, when you understand it, and when you see it, how God said, because he was the father of many nations. He wasn't even really the father of Israel. Jacob was. He was the one called Israel. He was one of Abraham's sons. Through Isaac. Finally, we knew that, and now by God, if we could get that through our head, that he brought us out of every kindred and tongue, people and nation, you would stop this pettiness and this carnality that you're putting one nation above another. I don't care what Israel's done. It is no greater than Africa. It is no greater than India. God has a covenant with them, and he's working with them, but he's also had a covenant with Ishmael, and he promised that he would open the door for Ishmael's children, and that's what's called the tabernacle of David. And it took Cornelius to bring it in, because Peter was too blinded to it. And the rest of the Jews. 34 years after Christ's death, a Gentile finally gets saved. The greatest revival that ever happened never came through a spiritual blood-washed evangelist. It came through a centurion wanting to touch God. And by his faith works, they went up as a memorial before God and released the angel over his house and released an angel of illumination over Peter's and challenged him and brought Peter to his house to lead him through the prayer of salvation. My God, how dumb can we get to still breathe? How carnal that we've been struggling for years and years and years to realize that God, man, if not an Israelite got ever saved, he still would have died for Africa. He still would have died for every other nation. Even if, if none of them came, only if one old Aussie Aboriginal came, he would, have, he would have welcomed him in and said, oh, good on you, mate. Yes. <laughs> Come on 
man. Let's call a spade a spade and not a farm instrument. <laughs> Let's get away from our theology and our own self-importance and our own narcissistic spirit. Where we try to be all that in a bag of chips to impress ourselves and the other people around. And let's get back and look at Jesus and what he really did and what he accomplished on that cross and who we're to be thankful to who come and paid that price. But split the heavens wide open. You need to fall in love with Jesus. You need to, I want to tell you, everyone else is a far distant second. I tell you what, you can't get close to the Son of God. You can't get close to the lover of our soul. You can't even, you can't even understand what he's got for you and the love that he has for you. And when you start to see him through the eyes of faith and you start to feel his presence start to come over your life and you start to feel cleansed and you start to feel like you're ten foot tall and bulletproof, you come up against every giant in the land. You come up against every impossible situation and say, me and my God can do it. I tell you what, if God be for me, who can be against me? We're going through. There's not a devil in that land. But I tell you what, I belong to the church of Jesus Christ and he said that if I belong to his church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. It doesn't matter if the devil himself comes up. He's got the walking papers because the blood of Jesus Christ is against him. Come on now. I declare over you tonight that your eyes be opened and that you would see Jesus Christ and you would grow in faith towards the finished works of the cross that he loved you and he purchased you with his own blood and he brought you out of a people. He brought you out of a dark place. He established you in a kingdom where you are more than conquerors through him who conquered for you and he's released all the resources of heaven and everything that he's got to help make you prosperous. I want to tell you, you just got to get faith towards God. <laughs> if we can build faith towards God, to realize there's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you can just start to meditate and just realize that he's for you and not against you, and he's willing to work with you, if you're willing to allow him to talk to you and talk to you like an adult, and if I gird yourself up like a man, I will talk to you. That's what he said to God. Sometimes God has to have a straight talk to us. Amen. And just shake this up a little bit. But he, correction is never rejection. Amen. He never even enters his mind. He just loves us that much. He just loves us that much. He just loves us that much. I just felt that shift in this room. Just like, like a presence just came into that room. Just, it's just overwhelming. You know, the, the Bible says that all of creation is crying out for us to understand that we are the sons and daughters of God. That Jesus Christ has redeemed us. All of creation knows what we're supposed to be, but we don't. <laughs> And we've got freedom in our hands and our voices and our lives. That we can come and bring people and introduce them to Jesus. Wow, his presence is overwhelming. I'm flat out standing up. Wow. If only we could come to that point. Where we can love him like he loved us. Where he said, if I spared not my only begotten son, will I not free to give you all good things? To have faith. To have the faith that you can get involved in it and you can start building something knowing that you won't finish it but someone else will come and finish it. That you'll dig up the garden, someone else will plant it, another person will water it, but God will get the increase. He said they, they believed God, they saw what he wanted and was willing to lay down their lives to purchase it. 
to actually become part of the crimson flood of the blood that flows from the front of the cross. The blood of the martyrs mixed with water. The blood that flowed from the side of Christ on Calvary that flows and is the river that we wash in of the water and the blood. What a powerful illustration that we can become part of that. And we have the right to enter into that. If we could just get that understanding and that we know that he chose us before the beginning of time. That he looked down and he called us by name. He saw us in the womb when we were conceived. He celebrated that eternity was created. Put a gift into our life that would help us. If we can discover it, it will bring us through and supply for us our every need. To know our calling and election, he wants to show us. The devil wants to blind our mind that we will not see the Christ or the destiny that he had for us, that we would invent a destiny outside of his will, outside of his purpose. But if we can come back to him and love him as a father loves his children and, 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 and we love the father and we realize that his intentions, are, he's never created a nobody. He always creates a somebody. And, and that if we give ourselves to him, he will, in, in, he will introduce Introduce ourselves to us, not to this, this, this fictitious person that had to grow up and raise himself and, and had to go through many hurts and many pains and, and many trials and many betrayals and, and trying to work out what's right and what's wrong and, 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 and how does it all work and which way does it all go and where do I fit and how do I get inside of it? I, oh my Lord, I tell you, we just struggle with all of that. And he says, I will show you, I will teach you, I will put you back together again. I will be the prophetic voice. I will cause you to grow and that you will become my daughter. I will cause you to grow and you will become my son. If you come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, I will be a father to you and you will be a son and you will be a daughter to me. And I have a destiny and I have a place for you. All I want you to do is to love me like you did when you first experienced me, when, when there was nothing else in your life. And that the way that a baby looks and when it realizes that, that the arms it's holding it is its parent and, and there's something about it. I, I remember just recently I was, I was at my son's house and, and uh, his little daughter Emma and uh, I just, she just turns and, and she was just looking up at her dad like there's these big blue eyes and, and she was so enraptured looking at him and, and, and this, this whole feeling come over her. You could see it in a big smile as she was looking at her dad and, and she's thinking, that's, that's my dad, you know, I made a connection, this is where I belong, you know, and there, there's something there, you know, that, that, that is so real and so touching. I just broke down and started to weep. And that's when we come to that place when we know him and, and we just love him and when we just are so caught up with him and there's nothing that we've got, man. Anything he wants, you can have it, you can have it, you can have it, you can do it, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, you can have it. We hold nothing back from him. Start to exercise your faith through love of God. God will never hurt you. You've got to trust somebody somewhere. Start with Him. He'll bring you back to love humanity. Because you can't be here, be around Him too long before. Because He loves humanity. He'll teach you. He'll bring people into your life to help you. He'll bring people into your life to heal you. I thank God for the people he's brought into my life to heal me. Because I didn't want to live. I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about before I'm saved, I'm talking about after I'm saved. And slowly, one by one, they started to come. That's how I got back into ministry. I mean, I went to do a tent meeting with a man that called me up and I swore that I didn't want to do any more tent meetings or anything. I was in business. And that's where I was going to stay. 
And I went to a tent meeting because I promised him and something came out there. I don't know why I went. I went. Angela Reed was one of the speakers then. I hadn't seen her for years. She was actually looking for me. No one could find me. They wrote a song about me. <laughs> Should play it for you next time. I will, actually. It's about a man who wrote a song. He's, he was reminiscing how he would come. He would sit in the meetings. And he'd sit in my hotel room late at night and listen to the word of God coming forth and the healing that would take place and how it revolutionized and changed his life. Very powerful song. And I went to there and I, I said I wouldn't preach. I said I would come just to support the meeting. And they talked me into getting up and talking and then I got up to talk <laughs> in this tent meeting. It was pretty packed. One by one, people started walking out. The first one that came out was a woman. She had a her young daughter with her, teenage daughter. She said, you don't remember me. And she said, I came to one of your tent meetings in Utica, New York. She said, I had a hysterectomy. But I so wanted to do it. And I talked to you about it. You told me that God could do anything. And you prayed for me that night. And you said, I felt the power of God hit you. Don't be surprised if God doesn't give you your desire. She said, I'd like to introduce you to my daughter. Wow. And then one by one by one, they started to come for the rest of the night. And they were just talking how the word of God flowing through me changed their lives. And I was weeping. All I could see was what the devil had done. All I could see was the people I thought that I'd let down. And God said to me, he said, there's much fruit, son. He said, they're still waiting for you. He said, you pick up the sword. You go back into the battle. That's not the sword to defeat the enemy. It's the sword to educate. So the enemy is already defeated. Most people just don't know it. They have the right to prosper. Amen. You have the right to break free. God's for you. Who can be against you? God's for you. Who can be against you? And all of a sudden, when you realize that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I used to love to smoke. I used to have, like to have a drink. When, when it wasn't popular. Isn't it amazing? Everyone that used to condemn me for having a drink and having to smoke, they're all smoking and drinking and I don't touch the stuff. <laughs> I grew up and they grew down. Is that my thing? But what made me give it up? I knew I was saved. I knew while I was having a cigarette I was saved. I knew that cigarettes didn't offend God. I knew that jealousy did. I knew that bitterness did. I, I knew that betrayal did. I, I knew all the things that really hurt his heart. And smoking wasn't one of them. Or having a drink wasn't one of them. But all of a sudden, I was I was in this hotel room, and it was just, whew. and I was complaining. I said, "My God, Lord, do I have to stay in places like this?" And you know, because it's not that with you know, it wasn't good furniture. It was dirty. There was you know nicotine. There was it was just you know just. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, "You know, consider where you got me living." <laughs> and I made a decision that day that I was going to clean up my tent. <laughs> and that if I would build his house, he'd build my house. If I would clean up my life where he lives and prepare a place for him, just as he went to prepare a place for me. It's not that he asked me to. Because I wanted to. 
It's because I've seen the need to do it out of love. And it wasn't legal. You've got to give up smoking. You've got to give up drinking. You said that to me, man, I, you're going to get a fight on me. <laughs> you know, it's because the love actions of faith. He says, I want, I want to do this for you. I want to do this for you. I want you to have that place. I want you, not because of your pettiness or anything else. Mm. I know that you would, because it's never about him, it's always about us. But that doesn't give us the right to abuse him. Mm. When someone loves us, it's so easy sometimes to take a use, abuse and you use that. Rather than to realize you've got so back into that. Because they need to feel loved too. They need to feel cared for. Love actions. Faith actions. Preparing a place, making room for you in your life for somebody else. When I bring somebody into my life, I take on a new, a new intern or something like that, I make room for them in my life. I make room for them. And I want them to feel loved and I want them to feel cared for. I want them to feel secure. The same as the way he makes me feel. I don't want to hold any good thing back. Uh, anything he tells me to give, I'll give them. Anything he tells me not to give, I won't give. But to help build them. Man has the presence of God here tonight. There is a tremendous presence of the Lord here tonight, and I believe it's an open invitation to go deeper into His presence. Amen. To just start to, every day, make a decision to trust Him a little bit more. Just every day to just put your life in His hands a little bit more. But you're going to have those that are going to want to take that. He's a jealous God. You know, if someone takes your wife or your husband, man, that's, that's pretty bad, isn't it? He said, I'm jealous. Don't give yourself. What belongs to him belongs to him. Don't give it to somebody else that's wanting you to serve them. You know, personally, myself, if, if someone's come to wash my car, I'm going to wash it with them. I've never let someone give me a massage or something like that. I... You know, but I'll, let, I'll work alongside of them all day long, building the kingdom of God. Very few people I'll let do personal things for me. Wash my clothes or something like that. I'll, I've really got to trust them. I've really got to know them before I give them that, that in way into my life. Because I never want to use people for self-gain. And God doesn't want to use us. God wants to build us. Doesn't he? And if we're building somebody, sooner or later they should become great. Or we're terrible coaches. We need another vocation if we can't break them through. Amen? And so... Breaking your fruit to God is just every day, just say, God, I, I'm going to trust you in this area. And you might stumble. Don't put yourself down. Man, get back up and have another go. Get back up and have another go.